Hello, I'm Faisal Pervez, a South Asia analyst here at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, our premier digital publication for objective geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. Five men jumped out of each car uh, with Kalashnikov shouting at everyone in the street to get out of the way. And then they uh, they grabbed us. I tried to run away uh, and to resist, but they um, they got me and, and clubbed me a bit with uh, rifle butts to get me into the car. Welcome to the Stratfor podcast, focused on geopolitics and world affairs from Stratfor.com. I'm Ben Sheen. And that was a short preview of our conversation with renowned journalist and former hostage, Charles Glass, who's now also a Stratfor contributor. Back in 1987, he was kidnapped while on assignment in Beirut and spent 62 days in captivity. After he managed to escape and reach safety, Stratfor Chief Security Officer Fred Burton, then an agent with the US State Department, was among those there to help. Three decades later, they discussed the kidnapping, his escape, and how Lebanon has changed. In part two of the podcast, we'll share part of a recent webcast conversation with a team of senior Stratfor analysts on the geopolitical significance of maritime choke points. Thank you for joining us. I'm here today with uh, Charles Glass, uh, author, journalist, and publisher. Uh, Charlie, uh, you and I go back, uh, as I was looking, almost 30 years now. It, it has been that long. And I think the fascinating aspect is uh, I was a special agent at the time and you were a journalist that was kidnapped uh, in Beirut. When you look back in that time frame, and I know you were kidnapped with the uh, son of the Lebanese defense minister, if memory serves me correct, is that right? That's Ali, Ali Asairan. Do you recall, Charlie, uh, any evidence of you being surveilled before the actual kidnapping? Before I was taken, I wasn't aware of any surveillance. I discovered later when I got out that uh, I was under pretty close watch and that they had, uh, that the Hezbollah operatives who were watching me had sent uh, cables to Tehran, to the um, responsibles in Tehran, asking whether or not they should pick me up. And the message came back to the Iranian embassy in Damascus to tell Hezbollah indeed to pick me up. That's fascinating with that uh, direct uh, smoking gun with the Iranians. Uh, when you were picked up that day, uh, what was running through your mind at the time of the abduction? Well, just before I was coming up from South Lebanon, where I'd been staying with my friend Alia Sairan, his father was, as you've said, the defense minister. And I wasn't um, apprehensive at all. I thought I was safe because he's from a very prominent Shiite family that um, we all thought would be untouchable. And I was going to go and have dinner with the Druze leader, Walid Jumblat, and then leave and go, go to Syria and continue a trip that I was making through the Middle East. Uh, so I was, I was actually rather self-confident that I'd had a few weeks in Lebanon, nothing had gone wrong, and everything would be fine. But as we were driving into Beirut itself through what are called the southern suburbs, which are areas of uh, then of slums of the South Lebanese Shiites who had moved into Beirut, fleeing the regular Israeli bombardment of their towns and villages of, from the 1970s onward. And uh, it's a, an area teeming with, um, well, poverty and all the political problems that Lebanon represents, as well as a, as a breeding ground for Hezbollah uh, militants. As we're coming into that area, an area called Uzai, along the seafront, uh, a green Mercedes pulled in front of us. And I noticed that he didn't that the car didn't have any license plates and that there was a black curtain over the back window so we couldn't see who was inside and i made a joke about the not having the license plates obviously it was a stolen car but the joke fell a little bit flat because a couple of seconds later the car veered sharply to the right blocking our car and then another mercedes behind us did exactly the same thing so the driver who was a, a lebanese policeman uh, couldn't go forward or backward. Five men jumped out of each car uh, with Kalashnikov shouting at everyone in the street because the street was crowded with people uh, to get out of the way. And then they uh, they grabbed us. I tried to run away 
uh, and to resist, but they um, they got me and, and clubbed me a bit with uh, rifle butts to get me into the car. Charlie, I remember uh, talking to you as part of the debriefing team uh, in Germany um, uh, after you had escaped, which just in itself uh, was an amazing feat. Uh, as I understand it, Hezbollah, uh, I believe it was Hezbollah had held you captive for approximately three months, then you were able to escape? It was uh, 62, 62 days exactly. And it was 30 years ago now. It was from June to August of 1987, and it's now 2017. And when you escaped, Charlie, uh, you were on the 10th floor of uh, an apartment, if memory serves me correct. Is that right? It was in 9th or 10th, yes. And uh, how did you uh, cope during that time in captivity? Did you... Were you always planning on trying to escape, uh, or uh, what were your thoughts running through your mind as you reflect back on that time frame? In retrospect, I realized that I was lucky that I was held alone, and very rarely was I allowed anything to read. So I had uh, time on my hands, and I was able to use that time to concentrate on any way to escape. There was an obvious way to escape, but I did everything I could to make it possible. So I used to put uh, notes through the bathroom window. There was a fan, not really a window, but a fan. Whenever the fan was off and they let me into the bathroom, I would push notes out the window in English, French, and Arabic, offering people a reward if they would call certain phone numbers of friends of mine to say where I was. Um, it was it was just, I think the only thing that really kept me going was this idea that I might be able to get myself out. I was also hoping that someone would rescue me, but that didn't happen. I know, uh, quite frankly, uh, we, we had uh, general intelligence of uh, where uh, you might have been uh, held at the time, and, and of course, uh, we had already had our hands full with uh, um, other hostages that had been kidnapped, Westerners, uh, Americans, and of course, uh, uh, the hunt for Bill Buckley, the um, CIA station chief, was, which is really what drove uh, a lot of our efforts uh, early on during the hostage dilemma. When you escaped, Charlie, I, I recall you telling me that um, you were able to flag down a taxi and then you went to a hotel and uh, you, you very much uh, wanted uh, to get, I, I believe it was the Syrians, to go back and arrest the captors. Is that correct? Well, no, what I wanted to do was to get to the airport and fly to London direct from Beirut. Uh, but when I got to the hotel, the security chief of the hotel was afraid that his bowler would know where I was and come back and raid the hotel and take me away. So, so he informed the Syrian army where I was, and they came and took control of me. And they then used that politically to say that they had, in fact, helped in my escape, which they, which they hadn't. But I didn't really care at the time because I, I, was, I was out. That's all I cared about. And they, the Syrians dragged, dragged me off to Damascus instead of letting me fly from Beirut and did a photo op with the Syrian foreign minister and so forth to uh, claim some credit for having helped an American to get out. Sure, I recall that. Uh, uh, Charlie, I know uh, if you wind back the clock about a year before your abduction uh, during the uh, hijacking of TWA 847, uh, you were the journalist on the ground there in Beirut at the time. Uh, do you think, uh, in retrospect, that uh, any of the hijackers or Hezbollah members that were involved in that hijacking were actually engaged in your kidnapping? It's not inconceivable um, because I assume that the kidnapping unit of Hezbollah was a very compact group who knew one another, and a lot of the, a lot of Hezbollah members would not be in the loop on on the kidnapping operation because it was a highly secret operation. And to this day, they deny that they had anything to do with kidnapping. Um, so it's probably likely, but I would have no evidence. I don't know who the individuals were who took me, or indeed who the individuals were who, who hijacked that airplane. I know we had uh, several uh, uh, infamous characters that were involved in the hijacking, such as uh, Ali Atwa and Hassan Izeldin. They certainly, at least Izeldin, we suspected was involved in some of the Western hostage takings. Uh, well, the, the, other, the, other, the other name that's often mentioned is Imad Mogniye, who was um, a, a, apparently one of the architects of the kidnapping policy going back to 1982 when they kidnapped the president of the American University, David Dodge, who was one of the, who was the first American to be taken. Um, but he, uh, as, as you know, McNeil was subsequently assassinated in Damascus, probably by the Israelis. 
Yes, indeed. Uh, his uh, fingerprints were under uh, were were on a tremendous amount of uh, terrorist attacks and killings and bombings and hijackings and and hostage taking. So that certainly doesn't surprise uh, I think either you or I. In retrospect, Charlie, looking at Lebanon uh, in that time frame, uh, do you think uh, that the country um, in, in many ways uh, has changed from uh, that time period? I know you were recently back uh, uh, visiting and traveling. Uh, what's your perceptions as you drive down the streets of Beirut uh, uh, and thinking back of in the, in the 80s? It's, it's the difference of day and night. Um, Lebanon is safe. I can walk anywhere in the streets day or night without without any fear. Hezbollah has rebranded itself as a legitimate political party that on the side has a militia ostensibly to protect South Lebanon from Israeli attacks and to assist the Syrian regime in its war against the jihadis in Syria. Um, the nightlife scene in Lebanon is like it was before the war. Uh, business is good. Tourists are coming. Uh, right now, there's a huge international music festival at Baalbek. And Baalbek used to be called the capital of world terror in the days when Abu Nidal was there. And now it's just, it's changed enormously. There is, however, a threat that Lebanon could revert if the Lebanese army should be weakened, if the, the ISIS militants from Syria would escape into Lebanon and foment problems between Sunnis and Shiites in Lebanon. Uh, things could could go wrong. But at the moment, uh, the Lebanese army has taken control of all the border area. Hezbollah has turned over its bases to the Lebanese army. And unfortunately, the U.S., which was largely behind this program of beefing up the Lebanese army, is about to cut, cut that foreign aid budget to Lebanon, which may make that border more porous and, and thus, thus make Lebanon slightly vulnerable. Yeah, that's a fascinating look, uh, Charlie. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Uh, now, you have a new book out, uh, Syria Burning, uh, A Short History of Catastrophe. What's that about? Well, I, I've been going about twice a year into Syria since the war began in 2011 for the New York Review of Books and uh, taking long looks at different parts of Syria and different people in Syria. So I've taken all of that information and the impressions that I gathered uh, and put it put it into the book to try and explain as simply as I can. It's a very short book. It's almost like a handbook uh, to people who are not familiar with Syria, what happened there and why there was a war and why the war is still going on and the foreign powers that are involved um, who are enabling both sides to be armed well enough to prolong a war that most Syrians don't want to take place. And uh, if people are interested in uh, getting the book, I assume uh, they can visit your website, www.charlesglass.net, or is it also available on Amazon, for example? It's available on Amazon and some good bookshops. It's from Verso Press. Uh, it's not very expensive, and it's, you know, it's quite a – in a few hours, you'll have a pretty good idea of what's going on in Syria. In closing, uh, Charlie, I'd like to before, – Before you close, can I – before you close, can I, I just want to say something. Um, a lot of people during the those days when I was hostage and uh, a lot of other Americans and British and French citizens were hostage, uh, there were complaints that uh, the government bureaucracies didn't care. Um, I don't know whether the bureaucracy cared or not about me, but I can I know when I came out and met you and your colleagues, I know how supportive you were to my family while I was while I was away, and they didn't know if I was going to come back alive. And how supportive you were to me personally and psychologically and so forth. So I think um, you State Department guys deserve a pat on the back for all the all the help you you gave us at that time. And and as as you know, I'm not uncritical of American foreign policy. However, um, you guys you guys were great. I don't think you could have done anything more than what you did. Well, uh, Charlie, I uh, very much appreciate those very kind words. Uh, I know that. Uh, um, we certainly tried to uh, locate you, and uh, unfortunately, we just did not have the human intelligence or the tactical intelligence to be able to figure out where any of the hostages were on any given day, uh, uh, but we certainly tried. So um, thank you very much for those kind words, um, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to visit with us today. and. Again, if anybody would like to get a copy of uh, 
Charlie's book, Syria Burning, A Short History of Catastrophe. Uh, it's available at all the usual uh, outlets, uh, and you can also find it on Charlie's website, www.charlesglass.net. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much, Fred. As Fred Burton mentioned, you can learn more about Charles Glass's new book, Syria Burning, A Short History of Catastrophe, at charlesglass.net. We'll include a link in the show notes, along with links to his recent contributions to Stratfall Worldview. Glass is among a group of regular contributors who share their unique insights into world affairs in the website's Global Perspectives section. If you're not already a Worldview member, you can get access to all our latest assessments, perspectives, and other analyses by subscribing to worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are also available. For the second part of the podcast, we'll hear an excerpt from a discussion with Stratfor Vice President of Global Analysis, Riva Gujon, and senior analysts Rebecca Keller, Evan Reese, and Sim Tak, and they'll be talking about the geopolitical significance of maritime choke points. This conversation was part of an hour-long live webcast about choke points, which is also the topic of a recent long-form Strat4 store report. We'll include links to both the full webcast and the report in the show notes. We hope you enjoy. As many of you know who have been following Strat4 for some time, we spend a lot of time studying the map and specifically how physical geography can affect state behavior. Now, the study of choke points is a perfect illustration of geopolitics and a historical and contemporary battle between land and sea powers with significant implications for global business and security. So we're going to dive right in with our, our, our guests and I'm going to start with with Rebecca and, and looking at the big picture when it comes to the global container shipping industry, which has struggled quite a bit since the global financial crisis in 2008. We saw a lot of sh- shipping companies getting a bit overzealous in their expansion plans prior to the crisis hitting and still struggling to this day. So, Becca, what does that that picture look like overall? The boom and bust cycle is is no new thing to global shipping, but since 2008, we've seen it an extremely difficult recovery. Um, several broader global geopolitical trends that we follow are factoring in here. You've got China's restructuring, you've got the weakening European demand, and you've got the fourth industrial revolution all changing global trade patterns. And we're still seeing the shipping industry, specifically the container shipping industry, struggle to come out of that. And the, it really all comes down to a supply and demand imbalance. There's an overcapacity problem in uh, the container shipping industry. And that overcapacity is projected to continue. And Becca, as we've seen that, that supply glut um, really exacerbating the condition for a lot of these shipping companies, what has been the survival strategy for most companies? We've seen um, many, in fact, um, the majority of of container shipping industries move towards an alliance structure. In fact, what once was a a four alliance system recently in April switched to a three alliance system that covers nearly all of east-west trade and 77% of the total global container capacity. And that alliance structure allows the shipping industry to to better utilize um, the larger uh, ships, which are uh, a large part of, of this overcapacity problem is, is the increasing ship size that we've seen over the course of the past decade. That alliance structure, however, is going to mean that there are now new winners and losers when it comes to ports of call. Um, specifically, um, I've seen reports that ports in, in Malaysia are set to lose traffic due to the new alliance structure, while ports in Singapore are set to gain. Um, Vietnam and Thailand I've also seen as potential winners. Uh, in the in the new alliance structure, and I'm focusing on the the Southeast Asia trade for a particular reason, and that's because that's where we're actually seeing the the most of the growth. Quarter one in in, in Q1 of 2017, we saw a, sort of a bright light for the shipping industry, where where 10% growth was was reported in the preliminary numbers, but that growth was primarily from intra Asian trade and specifically from Chinese demand. And so that, of course, is where we're seeing um, a great deal of commercial activity in that Asia Pacific theater. So why don't we zoom into that theater itself? Um, And of course, really, the big player here um, that we're looking at is China. 
Um, and as China's economic rebalancing is, of course, influencing shipping patterns. But let's pull back for a second. And Evan, I want to bring you in and looking at China's geopolitical imperatives always revolving heavily around guarding itself against naval interdiction. Um, when you're looking at the key choke points in this region, how is that influencing China's strategy? And what is China actually doing to insulate itself overall? So when we look at the Asia Pacific, we're actually looking at an interconnected network of choke points running from the Malacca Strait all the way up past Indonesia, Taiwan, uh, up to Russia. And China sees this as its first island chain. It sees it as part of the U.S. potential to contain China's growth and potentially cause damage to China in the decades to come. Uh, China for a long time was a very inwardly inwardly turned power going back into ancient times. But in the last few decades, it started to move outwards and suddenly it's abjectly reliant on inputs, especially from the Middle East and exports to the West. So it's very vulnerable to interdiction. And so when we look at, at China trying to break out of this, this island chain, Evan, and when we're looking specifically at the Strait of Malacca and, and South China Sea dynamics, how has things like the One Belt, One Road strategy really played in uh, to China's strategy overall? China's major strategy now is the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt and Road involves dozens of countries to increase connectivity across the Eurasian landmass and by sea. So what China wants to do is it wants to, one, diversify its land routes so it's not completely reliant on the Strait of Malacca, the South China Sea, and potential interdictions by sea. So this involves pipeline through Myanmar, for example. Uh, it also involves uh, road and rail projects through Central Asia, major connectivity through Pakistan. That's where we've seen a lot of progress. Another part of the Belt and Road strategy, though, and this is probably the core of Belt and Road, is the maritime strategy, which involves China investing in port projects across the region to try to transform the interests of local countries and potentially years down the road, station naval forces there. But we're still quite a long ways away from that. Uh, a big part of that are there's two ports that they're working on in Malaysia right now uh, on the east and west coast. And there's going to be a rail line that runs between the two of them, which China hopes will give it some leeway to diversify beyond Malacca. And so we see China trying to to build redundancy through One Belt, One Road. Obviously, these are very aspirational projects to a large degree. Um, a lot of these are, are very, very long term, but still fit into that, that geopolitical imperative that China has. Of course, there's a lot of attention that goes toward the South China Sea in particular and the potential for maritime conflict there that could lead to some more serious global economic issues. And so, Sim, I'd like to bring you in from, from Belgium. As, as you're looking at this from the military perspective, um, and we're looking at South China Sea dynamics and the potential for military conflict, how do you read the situation? Well, I, I think one of the big things to keep in mind here is that as, as we're looking at China, we hear a lot of um, a lot of discussion about how China is developing its naval capabilities. Um, a big thing to keep in mind, however, is that there's a difference between the capabilities that China is still building towards power projection beyond that first island chain, as, as Evan mentioned, and the capabilities that China actually has closer to home, its near sea defense. And when it comes to that area within the, the first island chain containing as well the South China Sea, China really has a, a lot of tools to use here. They've got a very layered capability consisting of submarines, fast missile vessels, and, and of course, land-based anti-ship missiles that it can use against any foreign navy trying to really uh, encroach on, on China's turf, so to speak. Now, when it comes to the risk of conflict, however, you know, a, a lot of countries have a lot to lose here if they were to actually engage China in a conventional uh, naval warfare scenario. Basically, all, all of the trade between these these different countries, um, such as, you know, the Philippines, Vietnam, all these countries have their own stake in the South China Sea, but they also depend on trade with China. And then in addition to that, of course, the United States itself, they also depend for a great deal on, on trade with China. Um, so in, in a way, the cost of waging war probably outweighs the, the real objectives within that limited theater. It, it has to be said, though, that in, in addition to that, we can't rule out limited skirmishes breaking out, particularly when it comes to 
uh, activity by the, the coast guards of these navies when all of the fishing vessels that are active in this region come into conflict with each other. There's always a potential for for things to escalate and to actually unwittingly lead to, to some kind of conflict. And that's it for this episode of the Stratfall Podcast. If you'd like to hear the full hour-long webcast discussion on maritime choke points, we'll include a link in the show notes. You'll also find details about journalist, former hostage, and Worldview contributor Charles Glass's new book, Syria Burning. If you're not already a Stratfall Worldview member, be sure to visit us at worldview.stratfall.com slash subscribe to learn more about individual, team, and enterprise-level access. You can even contribute to the conversation by sharing your insights in Worldview's forums section. That's where you can engage with other readers, as well as Stratfor analysts, editors, and contributors on the latest developments. Have a comment or an idea for a future episode of the podcast? Email us at podcast at stratfor.com or give us a call on 1-512-744-4300, extension 3917, to leave a message. If you have a moment, also consider leaving us a review on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to the podcast. We really appreciate your feedback. And for more geopolitical intelligence, analysis and forecasting that brings global events into valuable perspective, follow us on Twitter at Stratfor. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.